So this is the definition that we uh, all agreed upon. Uh, literacy is understanding, evaluating, using, and engaging with written texts to participate in society, to achieve one's goals, and to develop one's knowledge and potential. Similar, but somewhat expanded on a few concepts, and I want to go over those that now show up in italics to just make clear what kinds of tasks and activities we think were in this framework. So, uh, understanding can mean getting meaning from a large piece or it could mean locating a specific piece of information. Understanding covers a full range of the kinds of ways one can understand text. Evaluating. One doesn't simply read to understand or agree with what the text is. One makes judgments about the text. One has to, from the beginning of reading, one has to understand whether the text in front of one has quality, relevance, appropriateness, truth. So a fundamental issue in the literacy framework is one's evaluation of what one reads, what one understands. And of course, use. Um, if we didn't, if literacy didn't have social function, social value, we wouldn't probably all be here discussing this with such import and gravitas. So it's important to understand that you can take literacy and use it towards certain purposes and certain contexts. Uh, this was an interesting area of discussion and debate throughout our panel we felt that there was a need to also include engagement. Now, it turned out we weren't quite sure how we were gonna be able to do that in the cognitive assessment this time around. So it turns out that this ends up into, I believe, into the background questionnaires. But we believe it's part of the overall construct. We wanted to make a statement about engagement. We talked about three different types of purposes for text for literacy. Um, we moved to the term participate to talk about the social context of all literacy that it helps you to engage the world in certain kinds of ways. Uh, we talked about its use and utility towards allowing you to um, achieve in, in, in the world, uh, whether that's from basic survival to just personal satisfaction. And we talked about the functions of literacy to personal development. Um, part of that was to make sure that included in the set of materials that we had were all the world of education, training. This is a legitimate and large part of the uh, literacy universe. And we didn't want to simply take all literacy that happens outside of school, outside of higher ed, or outside of the attempt to learn. So that was an important element to make sure was in there. This probably uh, would be an area I'd like to have some discussion of over time, but one of the key uh, developments we wanted to do is to go to include in the definition of written text, both print text. I don't know if ink is always necessary to it, but this is the traditional text we, most of us grew up with, uh, and digital text. Um, I think my stronger statement on digital is, you know, literacy is digital now. Uh, the, in 1985 or so, that first survey came out. I think they had just about invented the thing called the internet. Uh, 92 was Niles, right? That, that was the World Wide Web, I think, emerged right about then. Uh, the world of literacy changed a lot. So uh, it's funny how we're linking back to a time when this wasn't even possible. Um, well, yes, it was. We could have put a overhead up. So very much a lot of our uh, new development was actually towards enabling items and tasks that capture digital literacy. Uh, as was noted, uh, there's a collapsing of the scales that used to be separated between uh, prose and document, uh, but we still conti you know, continue to honor the distinction between continuous prose texts um, and non-continuous document text and try to enumerate all the kinds of instances of genres and type of text that fall into those two. We also put some effort into thinking about the different ways that texts 
communicate their purpose and are structured around genre. So we talked about, you know, texts that are basically our descriptions of things, our narrations of things, expositions, arguments. Each of these requires a different kind of understanding, a different way of modeling what the text is about in your head and for its uses and functions, instruction record. We were trying as best we could to imagine a typo typology that covered as much of the universe of types of text. This would help us when we started to select text, not looking simply at their form, but also their rhetorical purpose, what they were about, how you would model the understanding of them. And of course, we, this is actually, I think, uh, not overly elaborated from prior forms, a little bit more generalized. Uh, so we have all kinds of non-continuous structures. Um, we have graphic documents, locative documents. I, I, I like the term, it's sort of maps plus. <laughs> so, you know, kind of entry documents. And, uh, and the fact that, and again, I think this is something that may have shifted a bit in the world in terms of its uh, proportion, its prevalence, combination documents. I mean, again, the World Wide Web, the Internet, the various forms we have now combine all these elements all the time. It's rarer and rarer you see just one type in front of you. And I have a few little slides to give you some sense of what the different kinds of combined lists are. Um, I think we also want to take this moment to appreciate that this was Stan Jones's selections of examples to give to everyone um, to show how these things work. So um, use of literacy to enjoy a visual medium. Nested lists. I, I do think this is a very interesting example where it's, it's the map is really almost secondary to the purpose of what this is, which is to understand a sort of movement or track of a storm. So, but these are all encompassed in this literacy framework. It's not just your print anymore. It's the whole set, and nor has it been in international surveys, but it's this very complex world of literacy materials. Did you, did you have something to say, Steve? No. Um, and again, it, no one can keep up with this, but as of whatever it was, 2008, 2009, we started picking out different kinds of digital texts and making sure that in our selections of materials, we were uh, including assessment items that probed your ability to understand and use these texts, including using the sort of unique features of them that distinguish them from just the paper and print version of them. So we really do have individuals move through hyperlinks um, in order to find and locate information and to use these things. So there's a certain set of knowledge, and, and I would characterize this as knowledge of the genre of the type of text. Just like you have to use an index to find something, you have to use a hyperlink. This is part of your literacy skill. And of course, we know how these kinds of texts. Uh, an interesting other evolution, I think, in terms of the prevalence of a different kind of text type is the fact that we now, I mean, we always had letters we could write back and forth, but between email and other kinds of things, we now find that we are really s understanding uh, lines of communication among people, not just authors publishing or credible sources publishing. The world is filled now with people talking back and forth about things they know or don't know. And so this became, um, and it, there's different authors and different voices occurring, and you have to understand this. So the, this was another important text type for us to make sure it got into the uh, mix. Again, social context, we were trying to cover, uh, expand if we could, all the different domains that we might sample from in terms of where literacy in the world occurs. And here we basically redefine those same sets of operations, though, that have been, again, this is consistent with a trajectory going back to the past of the way that you operate on text in a cognitive way. You identify information, you understand parts of the text, you understand the text of a, as a whole. I think it understood, if, I, if I'm going to go back to a, a change later, uh, I think one of the things we, we, we probably do, but isn't as clear here is, 
you also understand texts in relationship to other texts and other thoughts. So. And again, we tried to define out a, an extra level of understanding the different kinds of inferencing that one has to do in, in understanding or building an understanding or a model, different kind of text types, and that's what this is representing. So you can see that we were just trying to enumerate in more different aspects and ways, both the kind of current literature that comes into the understanding of reading processes and literacy processes, and make sure that these were all present in the framework in a way that helped us to select and understand the kinds of assessment tasks that we were building for individuals. Um, we recognized a few other factors that go into the complexity of tasks and the um, uh, proficiency, um, the fact that texts themselves can be chosen from uh, concrete to abstract, that there is competing information in front of you, so for uh, the prominence, so these are all aspects that even with a, ta with a text and a task can vary with what makes it easier or difficult to do. I'm going to move through this quickly. I know we got a late start and I want to talk a little bit more about components. But I think what these tables represent for you is the development process where the limits we had for the numbers of items and tasks that we could do with the linking to the past, with creating these uh, paper and pencil and digital versions. So, um, you have these and if you want to ask questions, they're in your booklets and your guides so you, uh, so you can ask me about them later. Reading components. Uh, I think Erwin did a wonderful job, thank you, uh, for representing why the rationale. We thought that it would be worthwhile to move towards reading components. Uh, I'll repeat that, that there was basically very little information available for individuals who would fall towards the bottom end of the scale. And since for policy reasons, that's a very important target population that we're all interested in. Uh, whether it's nationally here or internationally. Um, there's a body of research that suggests that all these, your higher order, higher level skills, uh, despite all these changes I've been pointing out in a digital literacy world, um, still there are some foundational skills that tend to serve uh, well in promoting your ability to move into that more complex proficiency level. And we identified five sets of skills that we thought from the literature could be assessed in a very uh, efficient way and would give us indications of what individuals at the low end of the scale could do as well as what they couldn't do. Um, and what we recognized though, we had the, both the constraint or, um, of wanting to do internationally comparable assessment and for that reason the alphabetic knowledge and recognition and word recognition vary so much from language and writing system across the world that we didn't feel we could, uh, at least at this first round, do an adequate job of ensuring comparability. But we did think vocabulary knowledge, sentence processing, and passage fluency would be something we could attempt to do in uh, international setting. Um, so that I jumped ahead of myself for this slide. So that's why we ended up building off of the bottom three components. Um, important discussion that happened in the uh, expert panel was whether in fact these components are really part of the overall framework. I mean, they are kind of different than past international surveys, which have really looked at sort of uh, authentic texts that come from the environment, and these are more constructed. Um, but it was decided in the end that these all represented very key elements of what we mean by an understanding of literacy. Uh, the vocabulary knowledge and passage fluency fit well into what we mean by understanding. You need to understand the meanings of the words. You need to understand the passages in a, in a sort of continuous modeling way. And the sentence processing test in particular, which asks you about the truth value of each sentence, whether you believe this to be true or not. So in a fundamental way, this was felt to be part of the entire literacy framework, even though there's also a, a separate document that describes in more detail how the components come together and the underlying research and theory for them. Um, so what we did was we built the uh, initial prototype in English 
Um, and then we had countries, I think it was volunteer, they, they could opt out or into the components, although most all of the countries decided that they would do this. And we then worked with the translators to translate them from the English into the other countries. And we had some very, very interesting discussions. And here's one feature that distinguishes the components from the rest of the uh, items. For the most part, when the translators are working with the rest of the uh, assessment items, they're trying to maintain comparability of difficulty. So that's part of their task. With the components, it turns out that if it's the relationship of your writing system, right, the alphabet, the logography, whatever it is, to your language. And if it turns out that your writing system makes it easier to understand your language in print, so be it. So we talk about Spanish, for example, as being sometimes called a transparent orthography, meaning you can simply pronounce it using a very routine set of pronunciation rules, and you always get the right pronunciation, or almost always. English doesn't behave that way. Um, some languages have reasonably complex grammars, and those are represented in different ways in the way it's written. Uh, so what we did was we basically said, no, translate these into basically the way your language would portray them. And if it turns out that they're simpler in some languages or more difficult in others, that's the way it works. That means individuals in those countries where it's simpler may actually have learned to read at a basic level more easily. Uh, whereas in countries where it's more challenging, then it'll take longer. Uh, clearly, a language like Chinese, where you do have to have a baseline of understanding a lot of what we would call, I think, comparably word recognition, because it's not a strictly alphabetic system. Um, it takes you longer to get past that first threshold. Uh, in English, you kind of get a basic going, but then because of all the sight sound correspondence problems, it changes. So the point was that for the components, the difficulty is going to vary by that relationship of language and linguistics. Uh, and again, we, we tried to move the construct a little bit forward this time by talking about engagement. And we thought that it was important to think about proficiency and literacy and overall as also being characteristics of the individual that uh, led them to want to have a an amount and a variety of reading, to have interest in reading, to have control over that reading process, to themselves feel like they were efficacious as readers, and that they saw it as a means of social interaction. So items were put into the background questionnaire to try to give us some measures and indicators of uh, individuals' engagement. 